Well, welcome to a very special edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We are going to speak with a friend and colleague of mine, a woman with whom I sat in the Senate of Canada. Uh, and so we have some shared experiences there, but she has just authored a book along with Ramona Lumpkin that really tells her whole life story. And I was just saying to to Nancy, as we began this conversation, there were so many things I did not know about Senator Nancy Ruth. Some of you may know her as Nancy Jackman. That was her family name for many, many years. But in, I guess, the pursuit of really establishing her own identity, she dropped the Jackman and became Nancy Ruth. Not surprisingly, the title of this book is The Unconventional Nancy Ruth because that she is. Wonderful, welcome, great to see you. How are you? I'm just fabulous and it's so nice to see you. Yes, it's great, it's been a while. We had, we, our offices were on the same floor so we ran into each other uh, a lot and you have really had, well, I guess that's the title, An Unconventional Life. You grew up in this wealthy, male-dominated Rosedale family in downtown Toronto, and you became a radical social activist. That's a bit of a leap. <laughs> what do you, how, how do you account for that? Well, it's a, it's a, it, it was a journey. My mother yeah. was always on the left wing of things. She had worked for the student Christian movement at the University of Toronto. She was the only vote for the communist Tim Buck in a municipal election, I think in the thirties. And everybody knew it had to be my mother, one vote in this subdivision, yes. So there was always that tension within the family, the need to create wealth, which was my father. Uh, but both of them had a tradition of taking leadership so I got that from both sides. And yeah. which side was I going to jump on, I guess, at some point? I really found the whole discussion. I think many of us who went through the women's movement and, and all of that had this uh, confused, tense, love-hate relationships with our mothers in some way. We saw fathers being independent and doing what they wanted to do and being a source of power. And our mothers, who were powers behind the scenes for sure, often succumbed to the will of the man. That was not 100% true in, in my case, but, but it, it's a story that I keep hearing from women. And it's only later in life that you go and give your head a shake and say, imagine how strong she was to get through all of that. And there was a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know until later in life too. I, th I mean, I, I, there were really two, two sets of kids in my family. My brothers, Hal and Eric, Hal's 10 years older than me and then my brother Edward and I. So we grew up with parents at different stages. And uh, I got used to seeing my father put down my mother for her sort of left-wing ideas or caring for the poor ideas. I didn't know she'd started the first daycare center for the, uh, uh, for the poor in downtown Toronto. I didn't know any of that in the dirty thirties. I didn't know she'd voted communist. I didn't, I didn't know any of this. All I saw was my father's perception of her, which was pretty negative. I mean, he appreciated her ability to be a hostess, to be well-dressed, to, uh, contribute to the cultural fabric of Toronto, particularly in the art world. Uh, he didn't particularly want her to go back to university so she could become an art critic in the, for the newspaper. But, uh, you know, later on, eventually I read letters and there was all this tension early in their marriage between Harry, I can't just raise children and cook. I have to do something for my mind. And this is a constant theme that gets picked up I mean, I'm, I remember, I, well, I heard all the fights when I was a teenager, the yelling that my father did. And then one day when I was about 16, I saw her, him push her, perhaps by accident, but he pushed her down the stairs. Wow. And I thought, this is not right. Yeah. And uh, I guess I made some commitment then that I would 
spend my time in life making sure no other woman had to have that experience. But I was still caught in the web of the sort of patriarchy because that yeah, was the dominant theme in my family. It was a dominant theme, but still you also wanted to please your father and, and be recognized by your father and respected by your father. And that was hard to come by. That was very hard to come by. And I made some really stupid decisions uh, to get <laughs> back at him. Like I would fail in school, which I was very successful at, that I would be fat instead of his beautiful daughter that he wanted to, you know, to marry a stockbroker and I don't know, whatever, have three kids. <laughs> it's, you know, they, they were mistakes that only hurt me. Yeah. So. But. Now, the, I, I want to come back to that because it ties into these other things. One of the lines in the book is that you, there, there's an arc of a life lived with emotional intensity. And, and let me tell you that even as somebody who worked alongside Nancy for a relatively short period of time, she does live a life with emotional intensity. <laughs> and, and it's great to see that you're here at this age and stage. Are you going to tell us how old you are? I'm 79. And so was this a moment where you needed to go back and assess to put it in some perspective? What was the purpose of, of the book? The book is part of a series from the Feminist History Society. There are a group of us um, uh, that decided that if we didn't write our history of the 70s and 80s and the early 90s of what we did, nobody was going to do it for us. So there has been uh, Michelle Landsberg's columns have been published. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, uh, there's one on the abortion caravan. There's one on women in sports. There's one on the uh, two women, first women judges in the Supreme Court. There's one on uh, women in family law. Mm -hmm. A whole variety of these books that have been published and it was decided that um, I should tell my story and particularly the constitutional bit so that that was recorded. So that's why it was done. I mean, every, there were a number of people that said, someone's going to do it, so why don't we yeah. do it? Have, and have some say over it. Do you think a lot of other people are quoted in this book because Ramona actually wrote it. Um, are, are you surprised by how they saw you as such a pivotal figure or did you know you were a pivotal figure? No, I didn't know. I that the childhood, uh, you know, poo, uh, poor poo bear can't get out of a honey pot type stuff, stupid poo, it stays with me to this day. There's always a side of me that thinks that, and that's partly because I had one brother, my eldest brother Hal, who was very in in some ways a Renaissance man. I mean, he. I, it's difficult. I have to listen to him. I can't. Uh, I can't debate with him. He's too quick, too fast, to whatever. And his. I don't know how big his brain is, but it's big. <laughs> so <laughs> that to to con, to be in competition with him yeah. was very difficult for me. So I'd do my own thing in the end. And and just. Like, have you reconciled that? I, I once went to dinner with you and your brother and others at a local restaurant. It all seemed very amicable. Oh yeah, Hal and I have uh, uh, made peace oh, some decades ago. And I suppose uh, he was over for tea last week and you know, so it is. I live around the corner from him and we walk, run into each other walking around the block, yeah. but um you know, he led his life and it, it, yeah, well, whatever. And you led yours. Yeah. What do you think um, and, and how did they describe, what were you to them? Were you this dilettante that was off running around choosing this cause and that cause? Were you an embarrassment? Were you uh, a pain in the butt? Like how, how did they see you doing all of this, uh, what seemed like radical stuff at the time? You would have to ask them, but my perception is to use the phrases you've just used. For example, 
uh, when Queen Elizabeth came to town, came to Toronto, and she was unveiling a statue, of, um, it's a memorial to the Air Force, mm -hmm. people on uh, University Avenue, universally known as Gumby. But uh, because I, this was the 80s, and because I was a lesbian and had a lesbian partner, uh, my brother Eric was not willing to have me there with my partner when everybody else had their partners there and their children. And I was so angry and went to China. So, <laughs> you know, there, there, <laughs> there are lots of stories like that. Now, you know, this is 40 years later. Right. So attitudes have changed. For sure. But, Okay, let's, I, the, the other thing I've got to say, and I'm sorry, it's kind of, I'm all over the map here, but this book was really, um, it really quite struck me. Um, what I did not know of your history was your very strong um, and oft thwarted attempt to be embraced by the church. Uh, you were a United Church, uh, well, Methodist first raised and then into the United Church. You kept trying the church because it was the nature of the times, kept saying no, but it was a very powerful force in your life. Yeah, I, I, I came from, a, well, we went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school, did those kinds of things that young girls did. Um, and I remember being confirmed or when I was 12, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then so as a teenager, it sort of wandered as uh, the flying as does. people <laughs> and eater and eat teensy weensy yellow polka dot bikini and those kinds of things came to the fore. Oh, I remember we used to, I was in boarding school and we used to hire a cab and go down to the CBC buildings on Driver Street and see who we could hang out with. And then we'd take, get a bottle and go down to Cherry Beach. The church was got a long way away from me in my teen years. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I had made a deal to go to London, England for a year and I didn't want to come back to Canada. I hadn't passed high school. I didn't have any university education. I didn't have a trade. What on earth was I going to do? And I didn't want to be a secretary. Yeah. Foolish me. I'm so glad I learned how to type long before the computer <laughs> came into being. Uh, so, my mother suggested I go to this work camp in Greece organized by the World Council of Churches. It was an international work camp. You did manual labor. And I got quite fascinated by the Greek Orthodox Church, particularly the essence of the mystery of God and the spirit, the whatever, the whole mystery of it was of great interest to me. Then I eventually came back to Canada and went to secretarial school and <laughs> God, I wanted out of the red fox jumps over the fence. And this <laughs> invitation came in from the World Council of Churches to go to Indonesia. So I, I, I just got to, I got to stop you, Nancy, because people who who typed on typewriters, uh, that was those were the letters that you use more often. That's the uh, reference to the red, to the fox. red fox. <laughs> Well, go I'm, ahead, go ahead. I'm glad to know that because I didn't know that. <laughs> they didn't teach me that. Yeah. Anyhow, this chance to go to Indonesia happened. It was the beginning of the Vietnam War. So my parents had some concern that I was in the arena. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this work, international work camp in Bali. And off I went and made all kinds of Western privileged mistakes. And But I learned a lot. And one of the things we did was we had to take prayers every morning and night. And uh, I remember one night it was my turn to take prayers to stop the rains that were flooding Java. And by God, you know, so I said it, but you know, did I believe what I was doing? No. And bingo, the rain stopped. <laughs> that sort of, you know, makes you a little, uh. But anyhow, <laughs> something happened some weeks later. I just woke up. And I knew that God loved me. I mean, it was like a conversion experience. It was, uh, you know, I ran out of, we were living in uh, bamboo huts with earth floors. And I ran out of the cabin in my thong sandals and just rejoiced. It was quite an experience for me. I mean, it, it was a real infilling of the Holy Spirit to use that language. Mm -hmm. Well, that was fine. And so I decided I'd come back to Canada and bring Jesus to Canada. Now, this is, 
<laughs> in retrospect, it's a very preposterous statement. Yes, did you not know that re religion was here? Well, I sort of figured it out and remembered what it was like when I was 12, but this was different, <laughs> this empowerment. Yeah. Anyhow, the United Church just looked at me and said, are you kidding? You haven't finished high school. You can't go to theological seminary. So you got to do this and this and this. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I did it. So that's how I started my bachelor's degree and started my study in theology. Um, th what happened was that I, of course, got introduced to German rationalism and Bart Tillich and those yeah. kinds of folk. And that was not about the spirit in which my conversion had happened. And it was such a cultural clash for me that I was not really able to adapt. So I think by the time I finished my theological studies, which I did very well in, um, I had probably moved from believing in God to believing in the community of love, i.e. the members of the membership of the church, yeah. churches. And um, that sustained me for a while. And then of course the whole goddess movement got uh, quite a bit of uh, power, so to speak, yes. in North America. And I was influenced by that. And we'll just talk it, about that a little bit. Well, I had some friends who were quite involved with that and ran various circles in Prince Edward County and so on and so forth. And then I went to an ex an archaeological exhibit in part of the treasures from Syria. It was in Montreal. And I, I don't know why I was there, but I went to this exhibit. And I looked at the goddesses in the, in the cases, and I could feel this incredible energy. And it was not the first time I'd felt that kind of energy. I've had two or three experiences, which are Jane Fonda, I guess, would call them out of body experiences or something. You know, there's a power issuing through you that is not you. And uh, that made me more interested. So I started to get involved and do things. And that sustained me for a while. And <laughs> politics sort of came by and that dropped and off too. And two kinds of politics, really the the, po the politics of the feminist movement and being involved in all of that. And you referenced earlier your role in your fight during the uh, patriation of the constitution. We were all there, premiers were meeting, uh, you know, well into the night, there were fights back and forth, the uh, provinces formed alliances and didn't. And then over on the side was this group of women, very loud, very present, very, in the end, powerful saying, there needs to be something in the constitution about women. Um, how do you remember that time? Well, I, I'm gonna go back a bit to uh, when I went to Finland, the World Student Christian Federation Conference, where the American women held a, you know, a sidebar you know, meeting and talked about feminism. That also was a conversion experience for me. And I, re I was just about 26 then. It was, a, it was, I realized I'd been sold a real bill of goods by my family. <laughs> that it was just crap. <laughs> and it didn't need to be this way. And that my mother indeed had been abused and so on and so forth. So that affected me. How I got to the constitutional thing was that when I moved back to Toronto, I've been working in British Columbia and Alberta uh, for the United Church of Canada at Naramata Centre. And when I moved back, no, from there I went to Britain where I worked for the Archbishops of York and Canterbury doing organizational development in charismatic congregations because the main church was losing its membership by the hundreds. So then I came back to Canada and uh, moved to Toronto and you have to change what's conferences in the United Church of Canada from BC to, well, what was then Toronto Conference. And I did that and a year, a year or so later, they threw me out. They removed me from the roles along with 10 men. I don't like being kicked around, Pam. And by that time I was <laughs> enough of a feminist, I wasn't going to put up with it. So I hired a lawyer only to discover that the United Church at, at that time 
you could not hire a lawyer to go to the Judicial Committee, which was chaired by Bertha Wilson just before she was appointed to the Supreme Court. Exactly. And when I went to Ottawa, just to go leap ahead, I stayed in an apartment right across the street from the house she lived in. And I was intentional about that. I mean, it wasn't intentional when I chose the apartment, but when I realized that history, like I'd get up every morning and do a little dance in front of the window for, for <laughs> Bertha and her work. Anyhow, back to the constitution, the church put me out and I sued them, all the levels of the courts of the church. And we won on the basis of natural justice. That's important because A, I knew about the law, B, my father died and I got some money, and C, the women were organizing around the charter. Now the charter organizing had started in 78, 79 in the Victoria Conference. Yeah. And Doris Anderson was head of the Canadian Advisory Council on the Status of Women at that time. And she had hired legal experts like Mary Eberts, constitutional experts to come up with draft papers so women in Canada could be educated. Now Doris, the Canadian Advisory Council had arranged a conference and Lloyd Axworthy, who was then minister responsible, said, uh-uh, can't do it, can't hold it. And we went off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were 1,300 people from across Canada that came to Ottawa on February the 14th, 1981. Uh, Joe Clark and Maureen McTeer, who were leaders of the opposition, uh, hosted us, Marion Dewar, hosted us on Sunday. We were in room 200 of, of the West Block in yeah. the constitutional room. And we banged out and drafted that Saturday and Sunday, the wording that we wanted to negotiate with the Ministry of Justice and whoever and whatever. And we also included, well, Mary Lou McFedrin, who is now a Senator, included mm -hmm. section 28 which says notwithstanding in this charter, uh, the rights and freedoms are guaranteed equally to male and female persons as in person's case. So it doesn't include fetuses. It was very intentional language at the time. So, so many things there, uh, I, cause I wanna go back to, to a couple of things. So your awakening from your experience with the American women when uh, I think you were, was it Norway? Um, Finland. Finland, thank you. Um, you. You compare that to the awakening that you had with your religious experience. Those, that seems like apples and oranges to me. Well, in both instances, I rewrote my own history or the history of the world as I knew it. And that's what's the most common thing about it. And I suppose for me, as a lesbian, in some ways, they were both communities of love. Yeah. Which you weren't getting either in, in your family situation or really in society at large. That wasn't really uh, embraced at that point. That would be correct. Yeah. Did, did you know um, through your whole life that you were a lesbian or did that awakening come via one of these other uh, experiences you had where you began to see your, lo your life in a different, through a different lens? It came as a huge surprise. Um, <laughs> there was a, a Dutch academic who came to work for the Student Christian Movement of Canada. And uh, when she first came to Canada, she was billeted with me in my apartment in Toronto. And uh, I fell in love with her. And I didn't know what had happened to me. And uh, a guy from the SEM who used to come up and dye my hair blonde, <laughs> <laughs> who was as queer as the $3 bills, we used to say, he said to me, what's the matter with you? Don't you know you're in love with her? And I just raised my head from the base and shook the dye all over the bathroom walls. He said, no way, it's not so, can't be. And then I had to sit and think about it. And so kind course, of a you know, third awakening. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I was, uh, I don't know, 27? 27, 27, and it just had never crossed your mind before? No, I'd had crushes on prefects at schools. Yeah. 
but that didn't occur to me. What did occur to me, and it, and it concerns me about the girls asking to transition now, the teenagers, was yeah. I was a, I was a tomboy as a kid, and I saw my brother Hal with all his access to women and stuff like that, and I thought, well, I could run a cat house, and then I, you know, service house friends, and I thought I. <laughs> You know, you, teenagers have wild dreams. I was going to run yeah. a barge up and down the Volga River and do all kinds of things. Um, but in most of these fantasies, I was surrounded by women, but I don't think I put it together. Right. It, it was just never talked about. I didn't know any lesbians. I knew uh, a couple of my mother's friends who were gay guys. But on the whole, I didn't know any people from the homosexual community. So did that then, I mean, that relationship was on again, off again and, and around the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you followed each other and what, what, how did that play into the, your embrace of, of feminism and all of the activity around that? Did it, enhance it in some way? I don't know the answer to that question, Pam. I don't know that it particularly had any effect in it at all. What interested me in having, in having some of those materials read to me um, in the letters I once wrote Trudy and said, if only we could be married. That was right. such an unheard of right. idea 40 years ago. And now look at us. Yeah. And I'm now some person who almost voted against the legislation when it was in the Senate. <laughs> okay, we're going to come to all that Senate stuff, but there were some stories about you in the church, and and yes, you did sue them and and all of that. But I'm also thinking of even the time when you were doing this, of standing up and talking. I I just laughed out loud when I read this. You were giving a sermon of such, and the the church was laid out as a cross. Uh, if you looked at the physical sense of the church, but but then you decided to describe that as a phallus, and that the 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 T part of it were really two testicles there. Like seriously, you did not think they were going to get upset about that. <laughs> That's a quote of Mary Daly's. I was quoting Mary Daly, but the article in the Globe did not say that. Right. So I thought it was highly unfair. I was talking about church architecture. And I said, you know, for instance, Mary Daly says. Yeah. It got me in lots of trouble. <laughs> How much trouble we sat security at the back of the church when the procession started up in the fall and make sure it wasn't shot in the back. It was really a problem. Yeah, I mean, it would have been at that time, and it would have been a thought you would have uttered yourself if you'd, if it had come to your brain first. Ah, uh, I won't, I won't claim that. <laughs> <laughs> but was that part of the just pushing, pushing, pushing the limits um, of in this relationship with the church, the way you pushed relationships with your family, with loved ones, um, with partners, like that is your MO, your modus operandi, because I guess you believe that's the only way you get from point A to point B. Hmm. I know, I, it's, it's interesting. I don't think of myself as pushing, but I understand when you, that's interesting what you've just said. Uh, how, if you don't give alternative visions, how do you right. how do you create change? And that was you. Yeah, but it was often, uh, you know, the visions came from other women in the communities I was in, mm -hmm. and I would just I'd been a stutterer as a child, and I'd had uh, six years of speech therapy, at some point in my life, and that turned out to be lucky because it made me a able public speaker. Yeah, and articulate. So where are you with the church today? Well, I haven't got a, much of an alternative and I'm heading towards the uh, hole in the ground. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know what? The organ music's pretty. 
and and uh, uh, I don't know, Pam. I don't know. I mean, I I, uh, I like to listen to poetry. Um, you know, there's still a spiritual side of me. Yeah. It's it's not enhanced in the community. Um, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's it's an interesting phrase you use when when you say I don't know because we are all so certain of everything when we're young. Our ideas are right. Everybody else is stupid if they don't get it. They're resistant. They're the enemy. And then you kind of come to a point in life where you go, I don't know. I don't know if that was really the only way or the right way. And maybe the way they do it now is okay. Like, are you at that place? I, yes, I am at that place for sure. And I was just, as you were talking, thinking my goddaughter, Winnie Graham came by, to, she's setting up an apartment at McGill. So I had some stuff she could have. Yes. And she saw the Venus of Willendorf, the little figurine of that goddess is the goddess I identify with. Yeah. sitting on top of a pile of napkins and she, and she knew exactly what it was and i thought oh god another generation so yeah. i gave it to her and then i grieved so i sent her a long text about you know caring for the venus and da, 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 da. so things get muddled in old age eh? <laughs> <laughs> um i want to talk about the time in the senate because uh there were a couple of well, two or three issues. You you were uh, on the defense committee in the Senate. Uh, that was for many years. I chaired that committee long after you were there. Uh, you wanted to talk about peace and the state and fate of women in war-torn countries. Um, I tended to be much more the other way. My experience in Afghanistan and also covering, you know, uh, war zones at different times, which is did our men and women have the right equipment and, you know, uh, very, uh, a very pragmatic kind of approach to this. Did you make any headway with your views? Uh, Mobina Jaffer and I did it together. She's another yeah. senator from BC. And there were a number of UN Security Council resolutions coming out. So the one that's in the book is just one of them. Yeah, but uh, our troops are going off to Afghanistan. I mean, you talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, them having the right equipment. Well, part of the right equipment is knowing what the UN is saying about troops that go in and mm -hmm. rape as a tool of war and all this stuff should be one of those tools. So we, Mubina and I would bang away at various generals or lieutenant colonels <laughs> or whoever they were. Finally, we got, we asked to see the training module the soldiers were, and it was a half hour, mini appalling thing. And when I had to sit on veterans, I hated sitting on the Veterans Affairs Committee. It was not my thing at all. So, you know, I would do this stuff on, uh, well, the role of women in the military or sexual harassment yeah. and stuff. And if you read the answers from the ministers, it's pathetic when you think of what's happening today with yeah. the generals being had up. You know, what's with these guys? So, but if you don't keep pushing those buttons, they don't, they don't know there's somebody listening and they don't give a shit. Well, they probably don't care anyhow, but if you keep irritating them, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a I mean, sore I, that can grow and fester. I think what, what I saw when I was there on the ground in Afghanistan was, was were individuals taking that up. There was a, a time we were there and there were um, a group of our soldiers who'd been out on a 48 hour mission um, dealing with the Taliban, dealing with the enemy. And they came back to base. It was a, an outpost base. And before they slept or ate or had showers or rested, they went back out to rebuild a school that the Taliban had burned down overnight. Our men and women did that. It wasn't actually in their job description, but I don't know whether it was a generational thing or whether you actually had your impact. Don't know. Yeah. Because know. people, there's a humanity that, that 
comes through in many, not all for sure. What do you make of the the allegations these days uh, against the former CDS and the situation and how it's been dealt with and the government's refusal to seemingly even provide some credible explanation? Do you watch it? Are you following it? Uh, peripherally, I, I, I read things that are interesting quorum still, so I get that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, whether Katie Telford <laughs> testifies honestly or Trudeau knew or didn't know. I've, I've got enough in my life to deal with without. I'll leave that to you. Okay. I want to come to the national anthem uh, and changing the words of the national anthem, uh, which you did accomplish. <laughs> it was a long slog. Um, and there are views. You and I have had this conversation too, which is, you know, you can tear down all the statues you want, but it doesn't change the past or the history. And you can change all the words you want in the song, but it doesn't change the fact that the people who went to war were by and large men. What was your intent? Well, the history of it, the author of O Canada, this 1913 edition says all of us, I was not changing it. I was asking it to be restored. So I went to Harper. There had right. been four, four women who'd come back in body bags from Afghanistan by that time. And I, you know, of course you go with, you don't go to the prime minister unless you have all your briefing notes and you right. show him the history so he can pass it on to his staff to check out. And we had spent, uh, you know, I'd hired a couple of McGill students to research all the newspapers in, in Montreal for editorials on changes at the you know, turn of the century. This was done in 1913 and there seems to be absolutely no link historically to going to war. I got, went to the war museum and I can remember looking at some of General Curry stuff and quotes and the demand that Canada should get prepared to go to war. Canada wasn't thinking of doing it when the time the judge wrote those words. The two are actually not connected. Now that isn't what I told Harper. <laughs> <laughs> what I told Harper, because I didn't think the other would sell at all. I had to give him a raison d'etre and I knew the timing looked good. So, and there were women coming back in body bags and we were singing in all our son's command. So in all of us is not just a gender issue. It includes all races too, disabilities, everything. It's all of us and it is our, everybody's national anthem. So it wasn't just for women, it was for everybody. Anyhow, he put it in a throne speech. I had no warning about that. Mm -hmm. And so people like Peter Mansbridge just took the mick out of it and uh, made it impossible to move for Harper to move for any further. So it was up to Maria. Because it was so contra. I mean, you know, I'm a member of my legion. I, when the last Remembrance Day ceremony that we had, mm -hmm. there is no one in that room uh, singing the new lyrics, but or the revised lyrics, uh, to make your point. Do you think it is, do you think it makes a difference? Well, I certainly hear from people that say it makes a huge difference. And uh, there are many other things people want changed in the anthem. That was the only one I could cope with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there are Catholic school boards in Ontario that are still singing the old version. Well, the old version is the 1980 version. Yeah. And we were promised in 1980 by Francis Fox, who was then the minister responsible, that they would deal with this. And uh, Senator Serge Joyal and the guy who used to be from outside of Ottawa who now lives in Cape Breton, Lowell Murray. Yes, uh, Lowell. A, agreed that they would bring it forward. That was 1980. <laughs> and Vivian Poy was the next one to take yeah. it up in the Senate. It still sounds like bad grammar to me. Well, that's fine, but it's what the <laughs> author wrote. They aren't, they're not the words I wrote. I understand. This is what the judge wrote. Yeah. We restored it. We were very clear to say we wanted to restore the anthem, not change it. Does that, um, I mean, it's so hard in the Senate as, as you know, I, and I, I think at one point you said, 
your time in the Senate really um, challenged your spirit. It, it took your spirit away. It's so slow. It's so frustrating. Um, so many issues that matter are held hostage by politics on one side or the other. Um, as you look back, are you happy with your accomplishments? Pam, my list of accomplishments is about uh, three inches in typewritten line. For 12 years of work, give me a break. Yeah. Well, you were. On the other hand, I wasn't going to resign my seat because right. I didn't think they'd appoint another feminist. And I was, didn't have much company in the Senate when I was there. What do you think of the Senate now, having gone in and come out? You know, the, the debate still rages about whether or not we need a second house at all. Uh, I will certainly make that case, whether it should be elected or not, whether it is what it's supposed to be. What do you, what do you think? I don't, I'd rather it was appointed than elected. Yeah. I think there is a place for it. If the House of Commons was willing to do a more rigorous job in their committees, yeah. I might consider the abolishment of the Senate, but the Senate picks up the messes that the House of Commons does. The right. Senate makes the compromises with ministers to adapt bills, to make them better for Canadians. And the fact they don't have to get elected, I think is a huge benefit because you get caught up in that squirrely business of getting votes and hits on your websites and yeah. media. You sites. ran for office, you ran as a conservative and anybody listening to this conversation who doesn't know who you are, you're a lifelong conservative. I am. And it doesn't so, mean I've always voted conservative either, <laughs> nor does it mean I, I haven't funded women in other parties. Exactly, which, which you did. And when you ran for uh, office, were in, again, in retrospect, were you naive or if you had been elected, do you think you would have been able to do more on the elected side as opposed to uh, the Senate? Well, <laughs> there's a certain amount of Rosedale arrogance that makes me think, <laughs> I hope I would have made cabinet. Yeah. And if you'd made cabinet, then you could have perhaps done something else. But I don't think it would have been easy for me in the Mike Harris government, which is what I would have been in, in retrospect. Yeah. It would have been but very you... difficult for me. And I didn't run until I, you know, I had this always this issue of would I submit to the discipline of the party? Mm -hmm. And when I ran, I thought I would, but as you know, it's hard to know. Yeah, sometimes and crossing the floor gets you nowhere. My reluctance too, and I mean, it was uh, as a journalist. I mean, you don't have party memberships, so that was uh, that was always very. I never thought about it, but when it came time to think about what next later in life, I couldn't imagine. Um, succumbing to or abiding by party discipline, some of which is just really stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly when I was in the Senate, Marjorie Le Breton was my leader for a period of time and she just made it very clear, you vote for the budget, we'll negotiate on the rest. That yeah. was the deal. Uh, of you personally, with you personally, mm -hmm. yeah. And then sometimes the uh, whip would say, would you like to go home early uh, this Thursday afternoon? <laughs> There's going to be a voted for, and we think you should be on the plane. <laughs> and yeah, I decide did. one way or the other. Yeah. What was the hardest vote you ever cast? Oh, pal, I can't remember. Yeah. I, I suppose, uh, I would think in some of those omnibus bills, there would be a lot, yeah. I would have a lot of trouble with, but um, that was the deal I'd made. Yeah. And, you know, I was appointed by Paul Martin as an independent right. and you sit, you cannot join a committee until what there's a, until the selection committee is sat and yeah. appoints you to a committee, the Senate appoints you to a committee. So for the first year, you're just kicking around visiting. And that was, you know, it was like having nothing to do. Yeah. 
And uh, that was pretty frustrating. And so when Harper won, and I figured, well, bulk of my years in this place are going to be while well, he's in power. So I'm going to go conservative. I think if there had been a strong liberal government, I might have sat with the liberals. I didn't really care. I wanted to get things done. Yeah, that is the thing. And, and you and I share a real passion for this issue called medical assistance in dying, the made legislation. Um, I was just coming into the Senate as we dealt with the first round, uh, a court decision five years ago. You were front and center then um, on the question of access to medical assistance in dying, particularly on the question of advanced directives, which is uh, now what what fuels me, What that that is what I think is fundamentally important here. How did you come to the issue? Oh, well, I watched my mother die slowly. Mm -hmm. And I had friends with Alzheimer's yeah. who couldn't have written a prior consent. Um, and you know, he's sitting in the senator on the other side of life. So. Yeah. <laughs> It is, and, I, and I've been a minister. You know, I mean, part part of being a minister is visiting visiting the elderly. Yeah, and those are cerebral palsy and whoever. You know. So, so, so that you have compassion for them. Yeah, that's that's how I see it too. That it's an issue of compassion. Obviously, there are some churches that cannot embrace this um, in any way, but but you found that that's what. I mean, I just grew up in a family where this was always discussed and always presented as a reasonable thing to do. My dad worked in healthcare, so he saw a lot of that. We, I think we're all shaped by that on these, on these very um, fundamental, I mean, I would call them profound issues, of course, that, it, that, that the politics is personal on these ones. Unless you're part of... A Muslim or evangelical or yeah. Catholic group. Yeah. yeah. So how have you thought about that issue for you? Well, my will, last time I did my will, it reflected all the language, legal language at the time yeah. of the last bill. Um, you know, I'm leaving it up to warriors like you, Pam. <laughs> there's, there's, there's uh, I mean, yes, I, I do my bit and I'm happy to work with Jim Cowan, who now chairs uh, Dying with Dignity, yeah. who was superb, you know, sitting with him on the Joint Parliamentary Committee the last time it met. So this thing will happen. It's a matter yeah. of time. Matter you know, of statistics time. will be collected, the number of people that use it, if there's abuse of it, all this stuff will happen in time. So yeah. being older, as you say, one is more patient. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've got we've got no choice on all of those things. <laughs> when you look at the state of play of women in politics, um, do you think the progress is more than you imagined or less? It's less. Hmm. Uh, but it's not so easy either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, things are complicated. Do you build the pipeline? Do you not build the pipeline? Do you divert that money? Did Chrétien make a mistake when he cut, cut the green energy programs? I mean, hindsight's 2020. That's no use when you're sitting in the chamber. You know, you do the best for the time you've got and decisions are sometimes wrong. And what about things? Uh, there's such a debate now about and partly it's because our world has changed so dramatically with technology, but the Me Too movement, um, important for women to have their voice, regardless of how long ago something occurred. On the other hand, um, people are, people's lives and careers are ended and canceled to use the uh, vernacular of the day. Where's the balance? I have not seen a balance. I think the pendulum has swung too far to using words like gender or cis, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
I think the words women and girls are being written out of the English language. I am waiting for the pendulum to come the other way. It upsets me that international organizations, that the whole of government in Canada has a 2016 Privy Council Treasury Board directive to use the word gender instead of the word sex. When all the laws on discrimination that we fought for in the 80s and 90s were based on discrimination on the basis of sex. I do not mind the changes that are in the Statistics Canada, whatever. What, what's that form we're signing right? Census form. The census we're doing, form. Yeah, that we're doing right now. But uh, when I know that two thirds of the teenagers going forward to transition are girls, it concerns me. When I was a kid, I was a tomboy. I told you the stories about, you know, Hal and the cat house and so on. It, I didn't know lesbian is, being a lesbian was an option then, but there were parts of me that wanted to be a man because that was my access to women. And power. And power, oh yes, power is a big hunk of it. And it, it two thirds of those wanting to transition, like I'm a, I, I like the Americans, the few American states that have brought in laws that says no puberty blockers, no nothing until you're 18. Yeah. I, I, I'm very sympathetic with that. And I resent people talking about gender violence instead of violence against women. I don't mind if you talk about violence against blacks, violence against trans, violence against the disabled or whoever, or whatever. But you gotta talk about violence against women. You cannot hide it in the word gender. And it upsets me a great deal. And that's what I spend most of my money and time on right now. Yeah, it is it is very troubling. Uh, the, the issue of whether, um, you know, men who have uh, transitioned to become women should be playing against other women in sports. Like you, you forget it's at every single level. It, it's, it's insidious in that sense. Like you're, you know, you don't, you don't often see it until an issue comes to the fore or somebody goes to court over it. But I, I think you're onto something which, you know, the, the lack of identity um, by, you know, making everything gender neutral might in fact be encouraging younger women to say, oh, there's still a route for this. It's not in my own skirt. It's in, you know, well, that must be, um, that must be a difficult debate going on in your head there. Well, it's quite unpopular amongst many, certainly in my city of Toronto. But mm -hmm. there are these debates going, I mean, I only track them in the English speaking world. Right. So that's all I can read, mm -hmm. but it's going on all over the place, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, you know, so. There's, <laughs> it's also about a hierarchy of rights. Yes. There was a trans conference in Jakarta in Indonesia a few years ago. And if you read the statement carefully and you look at the language in English, it assumes their rights are more important than anybody else's. My position on the disappearances of the, of the words women and girls has nothing to do with trans. Mm -hmm. Trans can go ahead and be trans as much as they want. It's nothing to do with me, but don't take my space. Yeah. Don't put me out of business. Or BLM, there are still a lot of women saying that that has become uh, strictly about race and color and that they have become lost even inside that group. Yeah. Wow. wow. It's, it's... <laughs> so do you get smarter as you get older? Is that your conclusion? No. <laughs> no, no. Open to more opinions, but I guess I have sort of a, a keen line I want to track down. There's only so much I can do too with other people. And I listen to the younger people. I mean, I was on a podcast with Women Moving Millions yesterday, the Canadian group. And there are two wonderful women, one running uh, an organization, Margot Franson, or developed yep. on sex trafficking. And the other is a, a young Muslim woman who uh, married early, was put in a hijab, had kids, and couldn't escape. 
Yeah. Eventually, I mean, she's become a, a great organizer. Fantastic people. You know, it's their turn at the ball, and I'll just keep dickering around on this language issue. You know what? When I was doing feminist theology in the 70s, there was, a, there was an American nun called Rosemary Radford Ruther, and she wrote something like, language is the power of the ruling class to define reality in its own terms and to make invisible all others. Hmm. But I now hate this word gender. <laughs> Nancy, it's great to talk to you, and I and and I hope people take the uh, opportunity to read the book. There's an awful lot of our history as a country, um, and our history as women in that country captured in that book, and your role in it. And I also want to say thank you for your generosity of spirit. You were very kind to me when I came into the Senate. And again, I'll broaden that. You have been a generous and kind philanthropist all of your life, and you've uh, used your wealth and your privilege to good end. And I think you're an example for many. So I just, I just want to get that on the record too. So thanks so much for uh, giving me your time today. This is, uh, it's been great to reconnect. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. I love oh. seeing your home too. <laughs> <laughs> this is my little place on the prairies. My yeah. little, um, well, we always heard about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. Seen. And I'm looking out over the lake today, which is perfectly still and the sun is shimmering on that lake and it creates a little bit of haze, uh, the three miles across. And honestly, I think I've died and gone to heaven. So there you are. You take care. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much, Thanks. Nancy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nancy Ruth, the unconventional Nancy Ruth, as you have just heard. Thanks for joining us today on No Nonsense. We'll talk soon.